I now give the floor to His Excellency Basulma Bazi, Minister of State, Minister of Civil Service of Burkina Faso. <coughs> Excellence. Excellency, distinguished president of the 78th session of the UN General Assembly, distinguished secretary general of the United Nations, distinguished participants, on behalf of His Excellency Captain, Captain Ibrahim Traoré, president of the transition head of state, I convey to you the warm greetings of the people and government of Burkina Faso on behalf of the Burkina Bay people. I pay a humble tribute to the memory of those great world leaders who embodied the hopes and dreams for a just and equitable world through their commitment, determination, and sacrifice. I'm thinking in particular of Fidel Castro of Cuba, Patrice Emery Lumumba of Congo, Muribo Kate of Mali, Ruben Umnyobe and Felix Mumier of Cameroon, Sylvanius Olympio of Togo, Che Guevara of Argentina, Martin Luther King, and Malcolm X of the USA, Nelson Mandela of South Africa, Jomo Kenyatta of Kenya, Amilcar Cabral of Guinea-Bissau and Cabo Verde, Marian Nugabi of the Republic of Congo, Captain Noel Isidore Toma Sankara of Burkina Faso and others. These leaders were largely executed violently. Others were assassinated. They died in prisons or from poisoning. Their only crime in each case was embodying the dreams, ambitions, and hopes of the peoples that have been killed, raped, trampled, and pillaged. Mr. President, my presence at this august podium before the UN on behalf of Burkina Faso, country of upstanding men, is not to beat my breast in lamentation. And I am not here either to make a flowery speech. I was sent here to tell you that the lies of states, diplomatic hypocrisy, the thirst for power, the frenetic quest for profit, the diabolical spirit of domination and exploitation of man by man, these are the true wounds that poison our coexistence and drive all societies toward perdition, including our organization, the UN. His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the UN. His Excellency, Mr. Joe Biden, President of the United States, His Excellency Dennis Francis, from representative of Trinity, Trinidad and Tobago to the UN, elected president of the 78th session of the General Assembly. His Excellency Luis Inacio Lula da Silva, president of the Republic of Brazil. Allow me to hear, cite excerpts from your respective statements delivered at this very podium at the opening of this 78th session. First of all, and I quote, we are living in an upside-down world. Bodies litter the beaches where billionaires bask. Secondly, and I quote, we are at a crossroads. We have a common cause that is leaving to our children a world with a better social environment, end quote. The, for the third person, despite difficulties, we can emerge from this. What we lack is not ability but political will. Otherwise, we'd be able to provide progress and peace for all, end quote. And for the fourth personage I'm citing, quote, there's a dissonance between rhetoric 
and practice the facts. The UN Security Council is paralyzed. The UN must shoulder its responsibilities in a world of solidarity and justice as laid out in the UN Charter. And this requires it to have the courage to fight inequality, end quote. The quintessence of these statements by these four August personages clearly shows that inequality throughout the world is deliberate. Otherwise, with a modicum of courage and political will, we would be able, if not to eradicate them, at least to minimize them. Indeed, every year we hear so many speeches as well as promises and commitments, but the proof of dissonance between rhetoric and facts on these issues relating to principles in the UN Charter, including justice, equality, dignity, integrity, self-determination, the sovereignty of states, the inviolability of territory, and respect for international law. The proof of this dissonance lies in what's happening in Libya, in the Sahel, especially in Niger, and the crisis between Russia and Ukraine. First of all, in Libya, after the catastrophic flooding, thousands of people lost their lives to assuage our consciences, every nation rushed to provide their condolences and solidarity. This was, of course, to give the impression that we're living in a society and that we defend these values. Intellectual honesty requires, and the history of our conscience tells us, that we ought to sincerely apologize to the people, the Libyan people, for collectively and individually being complicit, whether through pass uh, passiveness or active complicity, for supporting those butchers who caused the first man-made disaster in Libya. It was this disaster that brought Libya to its knees by looting it and by killing its guide before the flooding plunged it into further sorrow. And unfortunately, this human disaster was led by the UN under Resolution 1970, as well as the guilty silence and the complicity of ECOWAS and the African Union. This macabre intervention with Nicolas Sarkozy's France spearheading the effort killed the Libyan guide Colonel Muammar Gaddafi on October 20, 2011. If our condolences to the Libyan people had the slightest bit of common sense and were not hypocritical, then this murderous diplomacy would never have uh, taken place. And now Niger is en route to becoming a second Libya. Next, international relations are tainted by great diplomatic diplomacy with no conscience or morals, dignity or integrity, justice nor peace. And this is proven because there is a clear uh, hunger for devouring prey. Today, we unfortunately must see that contrary to the good faith statements made at this UN podium, which call for respect for the UN Charter and international law, leaders representing the people of Niger, this brotherly people, were essentially forbidden from, ex from accessing the UN headquarters. Burkina Faso strongly condemns this underhanded maneuver which uh, seems to belong to the practices of the past. And this can only be explained by a loss in, uh, of essential values needed for any harmonious life in society. The UN should never be used as an instrument in the hands of any country. Pan-Africanist leaders who fought for African unity are grandparents who fell in dignity, shot by the colonialists, these uh, great sons of Africa who sacrificed themselves for the honor of their continent, who fought fiercely against the slave trade and neocolonialism, all of them are, have had their eternal rest disturbed when they heard that a handful of exiles, African exiles, are holding Niger hostage. Yes, dear African continent, just a handful of your children have decided to humiliate you through the shameless lies of a state, starting with Niger. And therefore, I issue a sincere and solemn appeal to the people of Senegal, Benin, Niger, Ghana, Chad, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea-Bissau, and all the people of Africa to 
stand up in fraternity and solidarity in Africa in order to prevent the imperialists from setting fire to Niger as they did in Libya. President, Secretary General, distinguished first participants at this podium in the UN and before the entire world, I insist that ECOWAS, the African Union, and the UN must become true organizations of peoples instead of structures used by a minority of heads of state. They cannot be used and instrumentalized to destabilize brotherly countries by killing their leaders. This is the only way the UN Charter and international law could have any meaning. And lastly, speaking of, of the UN Charter and international law, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine is underway and is even desired by certain powers. And several Western countries, especially the U.S. and the European Union, have uh, provided all forms of military support to this conflict. The Ukrainian civilian population are used as uh, volunteers, and some of them uh, are even are piloting uh, tanks. They're traded as patriots in this war. Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso are dealing with a war that was imposed upon them by imperialism under the pretext of uh, terrorists. And they, they, these are sowing terror and destruction. Despite the UN Charter, with its principles of equality, justice on one hand, and on the other hand, international law, which has been often cited here at the UN, there is a massive chasm between in the treatment of these different issues. For example, take Burkina Faso. Civilian populations are dealing with lethal incursions monstrous attacks by terrorists, and they've decided to uh, mobilize alongside the defense and security forces. These populations uh, have been trained by the FDS, and they are called volunteers for the defense of the homeland. In Burkina Faso, we have 58,000 such volunteers, of which 42,000 are uh, communal volunteers and 16,000 are national volunteers, and they are fighting alongside the defense and security forces, the FDS, and they were trained and are guided by them. They only act under the orders and the oversight of the FDS in accordance with regulations to protect their lives and their property. These are the patriots that certain heads of state of ECOWAS and the African Union, exploited by capitalist imperialist forces, are trying to describe to the international community as militias. And that is the shameless state-sponsored lie. Mr. President, if the international community were honest and sincere in its commitment to fight terrorism, it would have no problem with civilian populations training themselves to defend themselves. There is a clear lack of honesty in the international community. Here are a few examples. First of all, when Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, and other countries organized along their common borders by pooling their forces to combat terrorism, France came out of nowhere to impose its instrument, that is G5 Sahel. Today, ECOWAS uh, suddenly has uh, established an intervention force to reestablish democracies. It announced a contribution of two billion U.S. dollars. But from the creation of this G5 Sahel until its dissolution, ECOWAS was only able to allocate 25 million U.S. dollars. So can they be really said to take seriously the defense of human lives as laid out in the Declaration of Human Rights and Peoples? Secondly, Burkina Faso is experiencing cynical sanctions after the coup d'etat of December, September 30th, 2022. This so-called international community led by France which just uses its lackeys in Africa, uh, tried to nominate a prime minister in Burkina Faso, but vain, in vain. Then they tried to impose various ministers and strategic posts within the government of my country, again in vain. And lastly, they negotiated a con the continuing relations so that Captain Ibrahim Traoré would implement their will. This was their prerequisite for his uh, being in power. But he refused this in the name of the higher interest of his people. And as a result, an avalanche of repressive measures, threats, and attempted coup d'etats was unleashed upon him. These are un immoral maneuvers uh, concocted in criminal laboratories. And unfortunately, all of these uh, macabre maneuvers were led by puppet leaders of African countries. And 
That's the case for this famous uh, uh, Accra initiative. Even that was not able to last for long. Thirdly, in addition to cutting off aid uh, and other problems with our FDS, we are seeing a, block, a blockade on material equipment for us, again, led by France. For example, for the important uh, air defense equipment needed to control and defend our territory, we had a contract with Brazil and the weapons license was supposed to come from Belgium, and the navigation and firing system, as well as the video cameras, was supposed to come from the U.S., and, and motor was supposed to come, and engine was supposed to come from Canada. But these, uh, this equipment was all cynically blocked. You talk about defending human rights at the U.N., so therefore I ask you to deliver to us our weapons that we need to defend and protect our peoples who are being killed. In any case, I am solemnly informing you of this. And if nothing is done, history will hold you responsible for failing to assist people in danger. Distinguished Secretary General and President of the Assembly, General Assembly, members of the international community, their international community has failed to assist states attacked by terrorism. There's been international hypocrisy, and certain powers dominate the UN. They are complicit in pillaging Africa. Shouldn't this international community be brought before the International Criminal Court for all of this? Our security must be assured by us ourselves, first and foremost, not by anyone else. When it comes to the Wagner presence in Burkina Faso, which has been, uh, which has been covered by a puppet press controlled by, the, by France, I would respond that we have, it's our brave FDS that is defending our homeland. Consequently, from this high tribune of the United Nations that magnifies the sacrifice of my country in, on behalf of national interest, I here applaud the memory of all those who fell with, due to weapons, magnifying the courage and integrity of those who are still alive, inexorably sacrificing for victory for our people and safeguarding our country rather than stopping the human bloodshed. It's fallacious accusations that have occurred and lies wrapped in hypocritical diplomacy and veiled threats to indicate to our partners that they need what, how we need to behave ourselves. And we say no. On behalf of the United Nations Charter itself and international law that you raise, to defend yourselves and here in this tribune, the African peoples and those of the Sahel and specifically are resolutely committed to fully assuming their full emancipation for true social progress. And thus, Burkina Faso will work with its partners that it wants to work with in a sovereign manner and buy from who it wants and defend how it wants. The fact that a country called Russia, Iran, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Cuba, Nicaragua, North Korea, or Burkina Faso, can buy and sell their goods freely without any intermediary, without any authorization from anyone, no matter what happens. Mr. President and Secretary General, let's talk about hypocrisy, and let's talk about state lies in this issue of fighting terrorism, generally speaking, in the Sahel specifically. Perhaps you don't ignore what I'm about to say, but let me lay out my arguments first. In the Sahel, we have some 10,000 soldiers, armed soldiers, that are foreign soldiers. Most of them are French soldiers, but there are also American soldiers, Germans, Italian, etc. They have weapons. They have flying equipment. They have surveillance equipment, which is the most sophisticated in the world, and yet, they don't see the hundreds of terrorists that are moving around in order to serve death and desolation, often with unimaginable weapons at their side. In Mali, in Niger, in Burkina Faso, there is no factory to manufacture weapons nor manu munitions. So who is recruiting these terrorists? Who is training them? Who is providing them with weapons? Who feeds them and with what means? Do you believe in this philanthropy on behalf of whom the Westerners have sent their armies to the Sahel to die for our beautiful blue eyes? Well, if you believe that, then what justifies the diplomatic irritation and other gesticulation of France when we told them to skedaddle with their armies? The real reason is really about the resources that are underground in the Sahel. Indeed, the National French Assembly voted 
and enacted Law 057 of 10 January of 1957, which then appeared in the official journal of the French Republic of January 1957, which led to the creation of the Common Organization of the Saharian Region, the OCRS, which brought together the parties of Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, Mauritania, Algeria, etc. This zone is unparalleled in the world in terms of wealth underground. For example, the water table, the most significant water table in the world, goes from Mauritania to Somalia and goes through Mali, Algeria, Libya, Niger, etc. The newspaper Le Monde in July 1957 put forth a figure of six to seven million tons of oil found below our soil, potentially in the Sahara, in addition to the natural resources that we also have, such as uranium, gold, cobalt, zinc, diamonds, lithium, copper, etc. You, the Westerners, you so much love the Sahel people, so much that you bring your military and your armies to die in the name of democracy, in the name of freedom and human rights and peace, then why is it that an African continent with some 1.3 billion people and the second largest continent of the world in terms of people with a number that the interpreter cannot figure out of the number of square kilometers, and 54 states has no permanent seat within the Security Council, such a huge continent with so many people and no right of veto. How do you justify that? Does that not go beyond a state crime? Is it not beyond a crime of the UN that that is happening? So let's stop with the diplomatic lying, the gross lies, which basically involves imperialist powers coming to the Sahel to defend, quote-unquote, democracy and human rights. And let's talk about human rights for a minute. Let's remind ourselves here of the first charter in the world on the issue of human rights was the Kurokan Fuga in Mali in 1236. That was the first document that addressed that. And let's go to the second issue, which is Africa does not like to compare deaths. That would be ill-mannered on our part to do so. So I will respectfully bow to the memory of all nationalities of people who lost their lives in Africa and in the Sahel specifically. But if we look at the hazards that are involved and we look at the unfortunate and condescending attitude of the president of the French Republic, Emmanuel Macron, often who verges on the ridiculous while glorifying a hypothetical condescension vis-a-vis -vis African people. And I have to impose on myself here the duty of giving him a little lesson on history, on his own history, because this is why your classrooms are full of children that are learning their lessons well and growing up in other words, turn to this story at the risk of losing the real story forever. But let me clarify here that no African people is opposed to the French people. There's no anti-French sentiment in Africa, nor is there any issue with our legendary hospitality and our love of our neighbors. Rather, the African people refuse the condescendence, the arrogance, the insolence, the sufficiency, the paternal attitude, the looting of our resources and organized crime. That's our problem. Indeed, for your memory, Mr. Emmanuel Macron, first, let me remind you here that through the BBC in England on the 14th of June, 1940, an appeal was launched by your own grandfather, General de Gaulle, to Africa to come and save France from the grip of the Nazis. Let me remind you, 17,000 Malians died during the two world wars. This is a blood debt that France and has hidden. And if we look at the book of Bakari Kamian, the professor of the University of Sorbonne in France, says, and in that same document, in page 345, there's a table that looks at the war and the loss of lives in the two wars people from Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, 80, over 82,000 fallen soldiers from those countries in those wars, and over 154,000 soldiers. And this is from a French source, a book by Henri Léger, Report on the End of the AOF Mission, from 1950 it was published. And this is in the archives of Senegal. Please see Annex 5. Now, 
Moving on to the next argument, the 17 November 1986, François Mitterrand, the French president at the time, in response to Captain Sankara said, and I quote, Africa was looted, and here I'm talking about raw materials. I should have talked about people. For centuries, we exploited you at a human level. We stole your men, your women, your children. We used you. I understand your refusal, I understand your revolt, and I approve of your fight. You are right to refuse to be a sacrificed continent. The time has come for you to develop your own economies based on your own goods and people. And the duty of these countries who abusively used you and used African labor, their duty is to restore to Africa what was taken from them over the last few centuries. End of quote. Indeed. Africa was always openly looted and pillaged, but still there is a great deal of wealth in our continent of people and mineral resources. By way of proof, let's talk about mineral resources. Africa has 30% of the worldwide mineral reserves, 40% of gold reserves, 33% of diamond reserve, 80% of coltan reserve used for telephones, 60% of cobalt reserves for batteries, 55% of uranium reserves. So it's for the defense of this Africa that the young people of Africa stand more than ever. Mr. Macron, do you still need a little bit of history in order to remember? Finally, before the regrettable exit and the unfortunate exit of Emmanuel Macron, the French president, he was attacked by so many other politicians and compatriots who live in the African bosom. But let me remind you here, despite that, German, the Germany, Germans have some 83 million inhabitants with a, superfice, super, a land surface of 340,000 square kilometers compared to Congo with 95 million inhabitants and over 2,345,000 square kilometers. Belgium has 11 million inhabitants and over 30,000 square kilometers compared to Gabon with 2.5 million inhabitants and 267,000 square kilometers. France now has six. 8 million inhabitants and over 672,000 square kilometers compared to Nibia with 2.5 million inhabitants and 825,000 square kilometers. So all of this clearly shows, and I quote, peace to his soul. Africa is the only continent in the world where the people sing and dance and applaud those who impoverish them, who starve them, and who torture them. The misfortune of Africa is to have met France, end of quote. It's true that the West was violent with Africa, raped it, and stole from Africa. So what is our share of the responsibility in all of this as African leaders? Is it not us, the African leaders, who have abandoned our identity? Our names have disappeared in order to make way for other names that do not match our realities. We need to reconquer our own culture and take ownership. And that's why today people try to make us believe that our values and our ad attitudes are not natural and are not part of freedom and that there will never be a question of homosexuality for us. Let me repeat that homosexuality will not take root in our countries. Mr. President, now what's just been described are very unfortunate labels used by the UN that can be summed up as follows, 1.2 million people who are in the depths of poverty, $2.2 billion of the United States money in, invested in weapons, 20 times the budget of the United Nations invested in the nuclear, and all of these should be compared to issues of development. Africa gets from the IMF and the World Bank $34 billion, vis-a-vis -vis $160 billion invested in the West. The paralysis of the Security Council, the paralysis of the World Trade Organization, increasing tensions due to geostrategic repositioning. The World Health Organization, which is increasingly dominated by Western pharmaceutical companies and trade interests. We see this, for example, with the priority attached in terms of trade to vaccines against COVID-19. The United Nations is more and more in the shadows of its own attempts of being taken hostage by a conglomerate of international powers. Now, by consequence of all this, the African people, generally speaking, and in the Sahel specifically, will fight 
tooth and nail so that ECOWAS and the African Union and even the United Nations become service institutions truly in the service of the peoples of the world for the profound emancipation of these peoples and true social progress. Because the lack of these organizations, their inefficiency, their lack of sincerity, their client-based decisions and variable geometry, their crimes, the promotion of bad governance, looting, dis social disorganization and corruption all lead unfailingly to coup d'etats, which are then just consequences of all the aforementioned. So let's look at the root causes, which will disappear. If we continue with this b putting our heads in the sand like the ostrich, with this hypocritical form of diplomacy, with state-sponsored crimes and organized crime, state-sponsored lies, constitutional lies, and the making heads of state for Africa, even the United Nations will not be spared this coup d'etat. In this regard, and in order to take our destiny in our own hands, Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso signed the Partnership of the States of the Sahel, which is abbreviated as the AES. The AES is an architecture that was set up to secure our countries by a treaty with revised authority for development, including the region of Liptogorma, taking into account the security situation and the lack of a partnership What's at stake here is our own resources and working together in order to eradicate discontinuity in operational maneuvering. Mr. President, I say here with force and firmly in an intelligible and highly spoken voice the following. First, we African peoples are profoundly democratic by way of proof our attachment to human dignity goes beyond democracy. It transcends it. What we refuse is the lesser democracy, this trap of democracy, which has been extended. Electoral-based democracy, which turned out to be a way of controlling our states through playing musical chairs with the leaders who are often imposters and corrupt, who steal and rape. Second, we Africans are today recognized in our dignity as people in the sense of one person is equal to one person? The answer is no. Above and beyond circumstances that have been set forth to put us to sleep, but rather to serve us. Sad is the African and black continent, which is scientifically recognized as the very cradle of humanity and civilization that has been placed under control and domination. Independent fac factions who have engaged in fratricidal wars and election-based democracy with biased aids, the wars for terrorism which are maliciously fabricated and maintained, injected against us, especially in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. Dominating us, that's what it's all about. Stepping on our necks, as was the case of the unfortunate George Floyd in the United States. Is that democracy? These are partisans of a special kind of liberty that is intellectually justified to justify barbarism against our peoples, fighting supposedly for dignity and sovereignty. And that's why we have decided to say no. No to all these so-called friends who want our so-called good or who threaten us with war, to impose their friendship. That's why we want, we don't want the democracy sold to us by wolves in sheep's clothing. We need to provide adequate leadership for our people so they can seek their own happiness, for the full emancipation and true social progress for our people, be it economic, social, social, cultural, or security development. Third, the African people, generally speaking, and in the Sahel specifically, have discovered the chains of economic, security, social, cultural alienation that have materialized in secret agreements with France where they committed to break their true emancipation. This includes, amongst others, the colonial debt. We will not turn a blind eye to this and pay it while allowing our people to die of hunger or thirst or disease. Second, the issue of the currency, the franc CFA. This is called the franc of the French African colonies. This is not African property. Legally speaking, Property is the right to be able to dispose of something in the most absolute way. 
according to Article 544 of the French Civil Code. A patent is therefore held by France on the currency, the French CFA, and therefore it is the property, but it's the property of the African Francophone states. And what's amusing here is that the bills are produced by France for West Africa, and they're different from those of Central Africa, even though it's supposedly the same currency. The same document recognizes the French CFA by decree 45 of the 26th December 1945, and it was signed, this legislation was signed by Charles de Gaulle, president of the temporary French government, René Plévin, Ministry of Finance, and Jacques Sousnel, the Minister of Colonies at the time. Next, the priority and interest for French companies in bids for public procurement and public offers. And finally, the exclusive right to provide equipment and military equipment and other types of military officers and colonies. If we ignore that these coup d'etats are often the result of bad governance and constitutional maneuvers in order to provide additional mandates, that will always happen. We need to be lucid about this and root out the real causes and require respect of democratic rules and virtuous governance. Five. The African people don't have a problem with the French people. It's rather the French policies and politics we have a problem with, the condescendence. That's what we reject. Refusing an ambassador to Niger is a violation of international law, especially Article uh, 1 and 2 of the Vienna Convention, Paragraph 9, on diplomatic relations of 1961. By deciding to refuse artists from Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger in France, that is a serious undermining of cultural wealth and f refusal of recognition. An artist is a psychic doctor, even at long distance. By declaring them, we do not want to have people unemployed, migrants and thieves and so forth in France. We do not want the looting, the cynical looting of our resources. What we want is a sincere recognition of our peoples throughout the world, which includes Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, that we should be accompanied in this difficult time on our path towards full emancipation with expression of dignity, honor, liberty, equality, prosperity, justice, and then, of course, peace. Given the situation currently in Burkina Faso, the Burkina Bay government has implemented vigorous action to adopt a new development plan, the Action Plan for Stabilization and Development, with four main pillars of priorities. First, to fight terrorism and restore territorial integrity. Second, response to the humanitarian crisis. Three, restore the state and improve governance. And finally, national reconciliation and social cohesion. These efforts are geared to providing the Burkina Bay population with better living conditions while commending our partners who have accompanied us, we heartily invite them, those who still have a doubt or who might be tempted by the false content of reports on what is happening, we invite them to accompany us with the following conditions. Long live the United Nations. Long live this 78th session of the General Assembly. Long live the people who fight. Long live solidarity. Long live free Africa. Long live the states of the Sahel. Long live until victory. The Minister of State, Minister of Civil Service of Burkina Faso. I now give the floor.